Here we go. <clears throat> and we're back in Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to start in verse 29. Matthew 14, 29. We're in the middle of this scripture where Peter <coughs> walks on water with the Lord. And so we pick it up <clears throat> in Matthew 14, 29. Well, I better read 28. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And so in verse 29, Jesus says, come. And that's the word for today. Come. What are you waiting for, sinner? What are you waiting for, saint? Jesus said, come. Are you lost? Come to Jesus. Luke 15, 32 says this. It was fitting or meet. It was fitting that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, was lost, and is found. Jesus says, come. Luke 15, even in verse 30, it says, as soon as this thy son was, come. You killed the fatted calf. So if you're lost, come to Jesus. By the way, come to Jesus now so we can all make merry, like in the story of the prodigal. If you're lost, come to Jesus. Are you burdened? Come to Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Come unto me, all, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come. Are you hungry and thirsty? Come to Jesus. Matthew 5, 6 says this. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Come, come to Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ is the great I am. Whatever you need, Jesus is the answer. Come to him now. If you're lost, he will save you. If you're a weary believer, he will revive you. Come now, tomorrow. May be too late. Now, back to Matthew 14, 29. I'll read it again. Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go the, to go to Jesus. So I want to look at that phrase, to go to Jesus. The water miraculously held Peter up. So he could go to Jesus. And that reminds us of how God orchestrates things in our lives miraculously to bring us to Jesus. He puts us in the right place at the right time with the right person to hear the right words for the right outcome. Hey, there's a good prayer, by the way. We should pray that every day if you want to be used by the Lord in the lives of others Lord put me in the right place at the right time with the right person and to speak the right words for the right outcome Matthew 14 30 <coughs> says but when he saw the wind boisterous he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. As a reminder, 
this whole scene is not only a picture of salvation, but it's also a picture of walking with God. So let's back up for a second. Look at verse 26. Verse 26. First things get scary and troubling. Things get scary and troubling, which leads to an awareness of danger. When things get scary and troubling, we're brought to an awareness of the danger that we're in. So many times God allows us to go through scary and troubling situations to get our attention. God allowed me to hit rock bottom so that there was nowhere else to look but up. And he did that in his great love. So things are <clears throat> scary and troubling in verse 26. Then in verse 27, the Lord makes himself known. The Lord makes himself known. Be of, it says Jesus spake. The Lord makes himself known. Jesus spake. It is I. Be not afraid. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Jesus spake. And this is a picture of that pre-conversion work of the Holy Spirit as he draws and convicts the sinner. The word of God. Jesus spake. He does that through the word of God and through the gospel. The Holy Spirit draws and convicts the sinner before he saves him. And we find that in John 16, verse 8. John 16, verse 8. Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the spirit of truth. He says, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And that word reprove means to convict and convince. And that's what he did to you through the word of God. And of course, we know that faith cometh by hearing the word of God. And then Matthew 14, 29, after the trouble comes, then Jesus makes himself known through his word. In verse 29, Jesus calls Peter. He calls Peter by name. Come. Well, Jesus calls us as well. And when we put our trust in him, in his word, we experience the miracle of the new birth. We are born again. And you'll find that in Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 1.13, it says about Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Then after that, after the trouble, after Jesus makes himself known through his word, after he directly calls Peter, then Peter walks on water. This reminds us that there's not only the great miracle of the new birth, but there's also the great and miraculous life of victory we can have over the world, the flesh, and the devil as we walk by faith like Peter does right here. As a matter of fact, Peter later wrote that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he said it himself. He says, Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Listen, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. That's the miraculous Christian life. Now, sadly, we do fall, but God's given us everything in the same chapter. Peter says, all things that pertain to life and godliness, we don't have to. Lord, increase our faith. Back to Matthew 14.30. Back to Matthew 14.30. It says, But when he saw 
But when he saw, as it has been said many times, Peter was doing great until he took his eyes off of Jesus. And that's how it is with us. We're not only born again through faith, but the whole Christian life is lived by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith. And again, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And that is why we are warned, encouraged, commanded over and over again to continually read, continually study, continually believe, continually obey, and to continually meditate in the word of God. By staying in the word and doing what it says, it'll help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Rather than doing what Peter did here, looking around at everything else. If you and I take our eyes off Jesus like Peter did, we will begin to sink into sin. But praise God, it doesn't end there. Peter says, Lord, save me. Thank God that even though we as Christians are sometimes weak in faith, the Lord is right there when we cry out to him. And he catches us with his mighty, merciful, and righteous right hand. He is so merciful and gracious. His ways are not our ways. When we are faithless, he remains faithful. Verse 31. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? I like that part. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Yes, even when a believer fails to walk by faith, even when we sink into sin, when we wake up in the pig slop and turn back to our father in repentance, he's right there waiting. In his great love, he runs to us, he cleanses us, he puts the fine robe and ring upon us and takes us back to his house for fellowship. He restores unto us the joy of our salvation. And then, at that point, we realize that it was him and his great love which sent the storm in the first place to bring us back to him. Praise him! Praise the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. Matthew 14, 32 and 33. It says, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Jesus can make the storm stop like that. So let's not be like Jonah and run away so that we have to get thrown into the ocean because of a storm and swallowed by a great fish. Let's just skip that part and abide in him. But we do praise him for his faithfulness to uh, bring us back. It says uh, in verse 33, Matthew 14, 33, they worshiped him. You know, when some people today call the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God, what they don't understand is that to call him, biblically speaking, to call Jesus the Son of God is to make him equal with God. Now check this out. The Greek word worship in Matthew 14.33 means literally to kiss towards the Greek word in Matthew 14, 33, translated worship, means to kiss, to kiss towards. Uh, and by the way, I'll show you what I mean. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 12, 
God warns men to worship his son or perish. Listen to what it says. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. See that? Kiss the son. He's not telling people to kiss Jesus. He's saying worship him. That's what it means. And that's what the Greek word means. This is Hebrew, but in the New Testament, it's Greek. And it means to kiss towards and is translated worship. So it's saying in Psalm 2, 12, worship the son. Worship the son. God warns men. By the way, the context of that is at the second coming of Christ when all the Antichrist and all his armies are gathered to try to stop Jesus from taking over and they're all warned and everybody's told, you better worship the Son or you're going to, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But the good news is in the other half of that verse, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So... <clears throat> Matthew 14, Matthew 14, 34 through 36. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. When the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. And he and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Now, there was no special power in Jesus' clothes. Now, you may say that's, of course there wasn't. But uh, I've heard solid Bible teachers and heretics alike turn this into some kind of doctrine called point of contact point of contact and uh if you want to know what that is you can just google that you'll find all kinds of different things if you don't want to know which i recommend just don't even bother point of contact okay it's the idea that because they touch you touch a certain thing and you have these i guess i'll get into it a little bit you have these uh, fake money preachers on tv where they bless a handkerchief and then you pay them 200 dollars for it and then you wipe your forehead with it and you get healed or something along those lines. The, you know, the Bible talks about in the last days how the false teachers will make merchandise of people. And uh, the way of truth will be blasphemed because of them. Many will follow their per pernicious ways. And it's a sad thing that many people follow false teachers. But it's also God's judgment too. Because most, most people that are deceived by false teachers, they want what the false teachers want. They want Jesus to be their uh, slot machine. They want Jesus to be their ATM. Uh, and so they get what they want. Because that's God's judgment. You know, I, th I believe that nobody is ever deceived against their will. You want to think that through before you say anything. You can think about that later. I don't think anybody's ever deceived against their will. And, you know, the reason for that is, and I'm talking about deep, deep inside. Re remember, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And only God knows how bad it really is. And, the, and Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. No matter how sincere you think you were or are. Jesus says, Men love darkness rather than light. Who's, who's right? Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, now, praise God. Some people do come to love the truth and receive the truth and accept the truth and, be, and, and obey the truth. And we praise God for that. But he's the initiator of all of that. If he didn't seek us, we wouldn't seek him. If he didn't draw us, we wouldn't come to him. Salvation is of the Lord. Uh, Matthew 14, 36, the last two words it says they were all made perfectly whole, perfectly whole. I like the sound of that. Perfectly whole. 
our God is able to make people perfectly whole, either through the physical miracles like this one or through the spiritual miracle of the new birth. He can make us perfectly whole. Another interesting definition that the Greek word translated into English, perfectly whole, like it means to save thoroughly. It means to save thoroughly. Which reminds us of Hebrews 7.25. It says Jesus is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for him. Excuse me, for them. <laughs> so, what's the word for today? Come. Come. Come to him now. Time's running out. That's how the Bible ends, with an invitation to come. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Okay, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Here we go. <clears throat> then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. In this passage, we will learn an important lesson as it relates to to tradition and to adding to the Word of God. Verse 3 But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now, normally I try to avoid answering a question with a question. But Sometimes the question is wrong and it must be done. And so Jesus does so and he says, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now here's a good question and an important question. <clears throat> but the first thing I want to do before we get into the passage is remind you of something that we find through all four Gospels, which is very important. And I've told you this many times. Jesus always pointed people to the Word of God. Again, whenever he was questioned, confronted, or attacked, he always used the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And you and I, as believers, should imitate him. We're told, be therefore imitators of God as dear children. Okay? It says followers in the King James. It's the Greek word mimetes. It means to mimic, to imitate. And we're to imitate just like a child imitates their parents and it's all cute and beautiful. Well, it's, it's beautiful when a child of God imitates their father. So, we've got to use the, word, the sword of the Spirit in all things, the Word of God. Um, when it comes to everything and anything, the answer is, it is written. Or as Jesus would sometimes say, have ye not read? Let's look at it. Matthew 12, 1 through 3. If you heard this before, that's okay. Repetition is important. Matthew 12, 1 through 3. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read? Have ye not read? And they, while he goes on to talk about King David, that's not my point. So I'm going to stop there. 
uh, all I'll say is this. They were not breaking the Sabbath. First of all, God made a very specific provision for walking through standing corn and being able to eat it. And also the Bible teaches, Jesus taught that the Sabbath was not meant to hurt people. It's for man's blessing. So it's silly to let somebody go hungry because it's a certain day of the week. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that happens when you're uh, following, when you're living a hypocritical life and just going through the outward motions. Uh, you, 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 start, you start behaving and talking and thinking crazy. Uh, and you're twofold a child of hell, according to Jesus. So, Matthew 19, 3 and 4. Matthew 19, 3 and 4. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Boy, we, people need to be reminded of that today, don't they? But that's not my point right now. My point is, have ye not read? We're starting to see a pattern with our Lord Jesus Christ, our ultimate example, that he always pointed people to the word of God. So we should follow that leading and also point others to the word of God. How about Matthew 22? Uh, just two more examples. Matthew 22, verses 29 through 33. Now, these... Uh, these Sadducees, as you've heard it said, they were sad, you see. Why? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Well, I'd be pretty sad if I didn't believe in the resurrection. Matter of fact, the Bible says, if Christ be not risen, we of all men are most miserable. So there you go. So the same day the Sadducees came, they said there's no resurrection. They made up this silly story about a man uh, and his all his brothers marrying the same woman. And they were trying to make Jesus look foolish and trying to make the resurrection look ridiculous. They didn't do a good job, though, because Jesus is God, and he knows how to answer. And so, Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do error, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And we could say that to many people today. And matter of fact, we better make sure that we don't err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Make sure you know the scriptures. Make sure you know the power of God or you will err. You'll be in error. And so he goes on to say in the next verses, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? Again, he says, have you not read? Now, why this is important, obviously, is because I'm pointing out the importance of the scriptures. This is also a little funny, though, because nobody knew the Bible more than these guys. So when Jesus says, have you not read? It's kind of funny. It's kind of ironic. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so, uh, this is incredible because the, the Sadducees, while they didn't believe in the resurrection or in spirits, anything non-physical, they did have high regard for the first five books of the Bible. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ amazingly proves the resurrection from within the first five books of the Bible. Of course, they were astonished at his doctrine. The next verse says, of course, they, didn't, they couldn't say anything after that. Uh, because when God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been physically dead for quite a while. And then God comes and says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, he's not the God of the dead, of the living. And that means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive right now. And they were alive long after their bodies were put in the grave. Another point I want to make, and this is important, is that the scriptures they had in the days that Jesus walked the earth were not the original scriptures. They were copies. 
That's important because Jesus held those copies forth as the word of God by which everything we interact with and deal with should be measured and put and, and held against. So there was not only the originals, but the copies that God preserved uh, through time. And so you and I today, that's encouragement for us. We have the word of God today. And if you speak English, it's the King James Bible. And uh, God has preserved it for us so that we don't have to wonder what the truth is. And we know how to deal with everything because he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So get a Bible and read it. Whatever you read, believe it. After believing, eat it, sleep it, and breathe it. And thank you, Shylin, for that line. All right, anyway. Uh... Jesus taught the preservation of the Word of God. Let's see. He actually said that in John 10.35, the second half of the verse. John 10.35, listen to what Jesus says. This is the words of Jesus Christ. He says, the Scripture cannot be broken. The Scripture cannot be broken. God gave us His Word and He is preserving His Word. How about Psalm 12? Psalm 12. Now this is huge right here. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Listen. Psalm 12, 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them, from this generation forever. So God has preserved his word. And what's wicked is that the new Bible versions change verse 7 from preserving God's word to preserving God's people. And of course they're going to change that because their Bibles ain't the word. They are changing his word. And so how can God promise to preserve his word if we want to change it? So you can do what you want with that. But Psalm 12, 7 in the King James says, God will preserve his words. But the new Bibles say, no, he, he won't. No, he won't. Of course, they changed the word of God. So what would you expect? All right. Verse three. A few more minutes. Matthew 15, 3. Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? Would Jesus ask you this question today? Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? I'm asking you now. Are you transgressing God's commandments to keep traditions that you love more than him? Traditions that you love more than his word. Think about it. <clears throat> Verses four through six. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. When people elevate religious traditions which contradict the word of God, it leads to more wickedness. You see, believing the right doctrine leads to having the right deportment. Be deportment means behavior, by the way. Uh, thank you, Layman Strauss. I'm not smart or anything, but I, I like to have the letter D in both of those words. So here we go again. Having the right doctrine leads to having the right deportment, the right behavior. Or having the right beliefs will lead to the right behavior. <clears throat> so rather than taking care of their parents' needs in the name of God... 
They came up with a tradition which allowed them to look holy but be selfish. This is wicked hypocrisy. And as I said, when people elevate religious traditions which contradict the word of God, it leads to more wickedness. Which reminds me, anybody out there running around calling other people Pharisees, you better stop it. The Pharisees were wicked, blasphemous, satanic murderers. How dare you call someone a Pharisee unless they really fit the description. And even in that case, I don't want to call them that. You know what the word devil means? The word devil means slanderer. Devil means slanderer. Don't act like the devil. Don't act like the devil. God help me, not just you. May God help us to remember what I just said and repent. Stop doing it. Don't call people a Pharisee and don't do the devil's work for him by slandering others. You got a problem with somebody? Talk to God first about it and then talk directly to the person privately like the Bible tells us to. We've all failed at that, but that's why I'm reminding us we need to get it right. <clears throat> because in Matthew 12, 36, Jesus said this, I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. James 1, 19. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I pray that every day. Sadly, I fail at it every day. God help me. James 3.8. James 3.8. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. But the good news is, even though no man can tame the tongue, God can. And if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And so I'll leave it with that for this week. Watch your mouth.